Western wildfires. We're on the ground in Oregon as major fires burn across the region, made worse by high winds and extremely dry conditions. Then, at an impasse, with unemployment claims remaining high, Congress still doesn't agree on an economic relief package for COVID-19. Plus, securing the vote, Russia and two other countries target the presidential campaigns as a senior Homeland Security official accuses department leaders of politicizing reports. And the virtues of going virtual. The pandemic prompts a major shift in the treatment of addiction and delivery of medication. The folks suffering with addiction are more marginalized right now than they've ever been. And we have to be there with meaningful treatment that can help them. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by... When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, a dedicated advisor can tailor advice and recommendations to your life. That's Fidelity Wealth Management. Consumer Cellular. Johnson & Johnson. Financial services firm, Raymond James. BNSF Railway. The Candida Fund, committed to advancing restorative justice and meaningful work through investments in transformative leaders and ideas. More at CandidaFund.org. Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security at Carnegie.org. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Wildfires are sweeping across more of the West Coast tonight with no end in sight. Dozens of fires have killed at least eight people, wiped out small towns, and destroyed hundreds of homes in Washington State, Oregon, and Northern California. Cat Wise begins our coverage reporting from south of Portland. The smoke was thick this morning in Clackamas County, Oregon, as some residents emerged from cars and tents in the parking lot of the local community college. The American Red Cross has set up a shelter here, one of 10 locations currently open around the state. Coffee and do, would you like some cream? Sugar. Many lined up for a warm breakfast, including 70-year-old Nancy Price and her husband Dave Silverberg, who is 90. They fled from nearby Malala and have been here for the last three nights, preferring to sleep in their car instead of inside the shelter. Dave said, we have been told to evacuate immediately. So we made sure we were dressed and we headed out the door. The couple, who say they are keeping their masks on and trying to stay a safe distance from other evacuees, have not yet heard if their home has been saved. We don't know anything. That's the hardest part, is not knowing anything and knowing we can't go back. All of you have been staying in this one car? Yeah, it's been a little tight. Tom Walden and his two sons, James and Jake, are from Estacada, Oregon. There's so many other things going on. It's I don't know how to feel or how, what to do. Or, it's hard. Four wildfires have converged in this mostly rural county on the outskirts of Portland, and thousands are currently evacuated from their homes. Firefighters have been battling blazes here for days, but progress has been hard due to weather conditions, and fire crews are stretched thin. Chad Carter is a spokesman for the Red Cross. The state of Oregon has been tremendously impacted by the wildfires that we're seeing throughout the state. And it's not just one wildfire, it's multiple. And so right now there are thousands of people who are being impacted and out of their homes and really dealing with probably the st most stressful and difficult past 48 hours of their life. 
The fires in Clackamas County are just one of scores racing up and down the Pacific coast, from Southern California to Washington state. In Oregon, officials estimate there are at least three dozen fires currently active, and they've described the situation as unprecedented. We are now approaching over 900,000 acres burned across the state. To put that number into perspective, in the last 10 years, um, we see an average of 500,000 acres burn in an entire year. We've seen that nearly double in the past three days. We have never seen this amount of uncontained fire across our state. So far, five towns in the state are believed to be all but leveled. In Talent, Oregon, a hard-hit community in the southern part of the state, evacuees captured the harrowing scene as they tried to flee. Fires stretching for miles and setting off explosions. Meanwhile, in nearby Medford, residents returned to survey the damage and recover what little they could. My wife passed away five years ago, and uh, we came here to look for her ashes. Everything we have here, we have nothing but this here, clothes on my back. At the same time, in Northern California, high winds whipped wildfires there to a new fury. The North Complex fire north of Sacramento grew six times in size in the span of just 24 hours. It now covers roughly 250,000 acres. Just days ago, firefighters had managed to contain 50 percent of the blaze. Today, it's less than 25 percent. And to the west, the August complex has become California's largest fire ever, burning more than 730 square miles. The speed and intensity of the fires there and in other states have officials worried. Already, a number of deaths have been reported in both California and Oregon. And in Washington state, news of a one-year-old's death has shaken the community and officials there. Back in Oregon, for families who have managed to escape immediate danger, there's great uncertainty about when they might return and what they will find. And in fact, many of the people we met here today at this Red Cross shelter in Oregon City are asking those very questions. Judy? Kat, uh, it's just horrible, and we can see from the color of the sky where you are. People's lives turned upside down. How are they coping? Judy, the people that we talked to today, many of them said that they were still in a state of shock. Uh, several people told me that they had to flee their homes really quickly, only got out basically with the clothes on their back. And they said, many of them just said, I'm exhausted after several days of really stressful situations. And of course, this is happening in their lives after a time when many people have been stressed with, with COVID and the pandemic happening. As you can see uh, around me, the smoke is really, really bad here uh, today. We, we saw many um, people, families, and in fact, children here did not have masks on. And then some of the people that I talked to mentioned family members with asthma, occasionally could hear people coughing outside. And several people told me like they felt that they could not escape this, this bad air, this smoke, because there's just so many wildfires around the state. They said, where would we go? The wildfire smoke is everywhere. Kat, you mentioned the pandemic. How is that affecting everything? Some of the people that we talked here today did say that they were concerned about going into the shelter due to COVID-19. The organization is trying to get out the message that they're doing everything they can to keep people safe, including temperature checks and cleaning surfaces regularly. And they really want people to know that they're here for them, handing out food and water outside. Uh, but it is an incredibly difficult time for so many people with the wildfires and COVID-19. So hard to imagine all of it. Cat Wise reporting from Clackamas County in Western Oregon. Thank you, Cat. Thanks, Judy. As Kat reported, there are a number of small towns that have been devastated by the fires. Marion County, Oregon, has already seen its share. Kevin Cameron is one of the county commissioners. He lives in the small city of Detroit, where many homes have burned down. He joins me now by Skype from Salem. Uh, Mr. Cameron, thank you so much for talking with us. You were evacuated. Tell us about that experience. Oh, thank you, Judy. It's good to be with you. Uh... Tuesday, uh, actually Monday evening, about five o'clock, we were told be ready to leave Monday, potentially at noon. Uh, 10 o'clock, we went to bed at midnight. Our phones blew up with emergency. Get out now. Sheriffs going through the town with their loudspeakers and sirens going. Uh, we got on the road with a caravan about one o'clock. There's a little bit of 
uh, go east, and then at the last minute go west. They cleared the road, uh, getting down. Uh, it's about a 50-mile drive to Salem. About halfway down, uh, the traffic backed up, um, and the reason why is there was a fireball right in front of us. Um, uh, I had two vehicles. I was in a truck and uh, one following me. Uh, and you can hear on the video that the person behind me was taking video and they were just scared to death. They thought, are we going to burn up? We shouldn't be going this way. And it was so smoky and so fiery. I was looking down uh, at the center line, just barely seeing. Uh, and uh, it, it was just nothing I've ever experienced before and nothing I would ever want anybody else to experience. What do you know at this point about your own home, your neighborhood, casualties and so forth? Well, I'm a Marion County Commissioner, and so yesterday, Army Corps needed to get some people up to do an exchange in the dam with our sheriff and some fire apparatus. We were able to take a tour. The town is total destruction. Uh, there are a line of uh, about eight homes on my street. Uh, it's miraculous, and uh, I have a little bit of survival guilt that, that, that my home was one of those that's standing. And around the town, there are several homes here and there that are standing, but the marinas in the town are destroyed. The, the, the only thing standing on Main Street is a little teeny old post office. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's just de devastating. And there were still fires and power lines down when we were going around. It was very, very dangerous still. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask you. Are you to what extent are the fires still threatening that area? Well, the fire, the, the wind event that happened for uh, almost 48 hours pushed the fires uh, westbound. So there's still spot fires. So if the winds swirl around, you can still have more fires up there. Uh, but the fires now throughout the whole state have converged. And uh, we have other parts of Marion County uh, that have uh, had to be evacuated. Our state fairgrounds is our evacuation center. And it's almost overflowing with animals and uh, people that uh, need shelter right now. Have you, in your years in Oregon, seen anything to compare with this, Mr. Cameron? Nothing like this where it's uh, threatened homes and had mass, mass evacuations. And, uh, and we're going to have casualties. Uh, we, we've already, we already know of two. And uh, it's going gonna, gonna to be gr a gruesome few days or weeks as we uh, actually get back into the backcountry where a lot of people live because they don't want to be bothered. And it's hard to get to them when something like this happens. Oh, such a such a terrible uh, thing that's going on. Our hearts go out to to everyone involved. Kevin Cameron, a commissioner for Marion County in Oregon. Thank you very much. Yeah, we will rebuild together. Uh, we'll come back stronger. Thank you very much, Judy. I'm Stephanie Sy with NewsHour West. We'll return to Judy Woodruff and the full program after these headlines. Updating our top story, at least 16 people have now died in the western wildfires. In Clackamas County, Oregon, firefighters have been told to disengage as two large fires in the area are believed to be merging. And tonight, the mayor of Portland issued an emergency order citing threats from those fires to the city. Also, Oregon law enforcement has opened an arson investigation into the Alameda fire in the southern part of the state. Overseas, a sprawling migrant camp in Greece lay in ruins today after a second fire in as many nights. Nearly all of the 12,000 refugees at the Moria camp on the island of Lesbos are now homeless. Today, they searched through debris for what was left of their belongings, but a Greek government spokesman accused the migrants of starting the fire. <laughs> They did this because they think that if they torch Moria, they will indiscriminately leave the island. We told them they did not understand. They will not leave because of the fire, except for the unaccompanied minors who have already been transferred. Therefore, they can forget whatever they had in mind when they set the fires. France and Germany have offered to take in children left homeless by the fires. Peace talks for Afghanistan are finally set to begin on Saturday in Qatar. The Taliban announced it today and Afghan officials confirmed it. The two sides squabbled for months before agreeing on a prisoner exchange as a prerequisite for the talks. 
Back in this country, new claims for jobless benefits stayed at 884,000 last week. Fresh evidence that the economic recovery may be slowing. Meanwhile, Senate Republican efforts to pass a new pandemic relief bill stalled again today. A slimmed down bill failed on a procedural vote. We'll take a closer look at all of this after the news summary. President Trump faced more fallout today over charges that he misled the country about COVID-19. A new book by Bob Woodward, including audio recordings of their conversation, shows the president knew the gravity of the virus early on, but played it down. At the White House today, he insisted he acted properly. I didn't lie. What I said is we have to be calm. We can't be panicked. Outwardly, I said it's a very serious problem. And it's always a serious problem. That doesn't mean I'm going to jump up and down in the air and start saying, people are going to die, people are going to die. No, no, I'm not going to do that. We're going to get through this. Top Democrats kept up strong criticism of the president's words today. The party's vice presidential nominee, Kamala Harris, spoke in Miami. We need leadership that sees and recognizes the suffering and is prompted then to be guided by truth and fact and not what is in their political self-interest, which is what we have seen in Donald Trump. Mr. Trump campaigned tonight in Michigan, where the Democratic governor warned the rally could spread the virus. Twitter says it will start labeling or removing misleading claims that could undermine confidence in elections. That includes false claims about ballot tampering or election results. Last May, the company began labeling some of President Trump's tweets with fact checks. Questions are being raised tonight about more potential manufacturing defects in Boeing's 787 Dreamliner. Late today, it was reported the latest issue involves the vertical tail fin on the jet. The Federal Aviation Administration reiterated that it is investigating several production flaws affecting certain 787s. Grave new numbers tonight show global wildlife numbers are down nearly 70% since 1970. The World Wildlife Fund points to human population growth and resource consumption as causes. In a NewsHour interview, famed naturalist Sir David Attenborough said this study and ongoing U.S. natural disasters are a wake-up call. You've got rising sea levels. Uh, you had cyclones, hurricanes moving through with greater ferocity than, and frequency than ever before. We see on our television usual coverage of appalling things that happened in your country. Devastation. The study says the loss of biodiversity directly threatens the global food supply. And actress Diana Rigg has died in London after fighting cancer. She came to fame on the 1960s TV series The Avengers, playing secret agent Emma Peel. Later, she played the only woman ever to marry James Bond in the 1969 thriller on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And more recently, Rigg had a recurring role on Game of Thrones, gaining a new generation of fans. Diana Rigg was 82 years old. Still to come on the news hour with Judy Woodruff, Congress remains in a stalemate over an economic relief package for COVID-19. Election security remains in question as multiple countries target both campaigns. We examine the U.S.'s uneven response to the pandemic and much more. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Congress tonight remains stuck over how to address the economic crisis of the pandemic. As we noted earlier, there were not enough votes in the Senate to advance a Republican proposal, one that was not as far-reaching as other ideas that were floated in recent months. This morning, the Republican and Democratic leaders in the Senate blamed the other side for the gridlock. Republicans have tried repeatedly to build on the CARES Act and get more help out the door to American families. Democrats have blocked us at every turn. They've invented different excuses each time. But this bill is not going to happen because it is so emaciated, so filled with poison pills, so partisanly designed, it was designed to fail. And our Yumi Jalcinder has been tracking progress on COVID relief, and she joins me now with an update. 
So hello, Yumi. So this bill uh, went down to defeat not enough votes. Tell us what was in it and what happened when it came up for a procedural vote. Well, Judy, this is really the latest push to get some sort of coronavirus relief to Americans who are badly in need of some sort of help. This was a GOP effort. It was expected to fail, and it did fail as expected. It failed along party lines, so every Democrat in the Senate voted against this bill, along with Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. He also voted against this, but all the Republicans voted in line lockstep with Senator Mitch McConnell. Now, this is seen as somewhat of a, a success for Mitch McConnell, even though it failed, because for, for weeks and months, Senate Republicans in their own caucus couldn't figure out and how to get together and, and back something. Um, but this was called the skinny GOP plan. And I want to walk you through why it was called skinny. Um, to walk through what the bill was in, what was in the bill, you had $650 billion in total spending, but there was only $300 billion in new spending because the bill would have repurposed roughly $350 billion in previously approved spending. There's also $300 in weekly enhanced unemployment benefits. This would be to replace the $600 that expired in July on July 31st. There was also money for small businesses, coronavirus testing, and schools. But there were no new stimulus checks, and there was no new aid for state and local governments. And essentially what this was with the Republicans putting up and saying, here's what we could do. Um, but it was vastly different, vastly different, Judy, than what Democrats did and, and what Democrats want. Even in May, when the House passed their bill, it was more than $3 trillion. So as you can tell, both sides are very far apart. So, so Yumish, what are now the Republicans and Democrats saying about uh, coronavirus relief and the way forward? Well, both Democrats and Republicans are essentially pointing figures at each other and saying the other party is to blame. Um, Senator Mitch McConnell today said that Democrats, um, they would have wanted to support some of the things in this bill, but that they were essentially holding out for a bigger bill. And we also heard from Democrats essentially saying that Mitch McConnell wanted political cover, and as a result, he was pushing forward this bill. All of this really goes to say that the talks that stalled in August over a new coronavirus bill, they're still, they're still stalled. Um, and su suggestions are now that Congress could actually adjourn and leave without having a new deal. And Senator Marco Rubio, um, Lisa, who was on vacation, this week, she flagged this. He put out a video essentially saying, sorry, American people, um, we're probably not going to be able to pass any sort of relief for you until after the election. And Yamish, you cover the White House. Are they saying they may try to do something with regard to, to COVID relief? And, and how is this affecting Americans across the country? Essentially, Americans across the country who are terrified and scared and a lot of them jobless, they are not going to be able to get any sort of relief from the federal government anytime soon. The White House is talking about doing some sort of executive actions, including um, putting money toward airline industries, putting money toward school vouchers. Um, I talked to a White House source today, though, that said that the mo mo many of the things that they want to do, including payroll tax and other things, that it's severely limited because they're the executive branch. So the Congress is the place that, that controls the purse. So and essentially, Essentially, what we have here is a, a, a stalemate where America, Americans, I should say, are left in the wind, and they're the ones who are struggling. Just extraordinary uh, to see uh, nothing, nothing happening. Yamish Alcinda reporting for us. Thank you, Yamish. Thanks. The U.S. election is a target. Microsoft announces today that Russia, China, and Iran are trying to hack political parties, presidential campaigns, and consultants. It comes one day after a whistleblower from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security claims that he was urged to downplay Russian interference and was under constant White House pressure to skew intelligence. Our Nick Schifrin and Amna Nawaz help fill in the picture. Hello to both of you. Nick, I'm going to start with you. Tell us exactly what it was that Microsoft announced today. Yeah, Microsoft says foreign groups have stepped up their efforts targeting the election and cites three examples. The same Russian military intelligence unit that hacked and leaked in 2016 has now targeted 200 organizations, including campaigns, political consultants, and one independent analyst I spoke to say one of those targeted unsuccessfully SKDK, SKDK Knickerbocker, which consults for Biden. Microsoft also says Chinese actors on a smaller scale 
unsuccessfully targeted people affiliated with the Biden campaign and a prominent individual formally associated with the Trump administration, but we have no details on that. And Microsoft says Iranian actors tried unsuccessfully to log into the accounts of Trump administration and campaign officials. Now, Microsoft acknowledges that some of these foreign influence operations have been successful, and it also details how Russians are going to new lengths to avoid detection. The Department of Homeland Security and Intelligence officials said today this is a sign of public-private partnership over election security, but Judy, it should be noted there has been no release of any stolen data to influence the election, at least not so far. So, Nick, with regard to Russian influence operations, it, the Trump administration was targeting them today. Yeah, these are actions from the Departments of Treasury and Justice that really highlight the spectrum of Russian attempts to continue to influence the election. The Treasury Department sanctioned a Ukrainian member of parliament whom it calls an active Russian agent. He has released videos designed to disparage Joe Biden. And this is an example of Russia's ongoing attempt to weaponize divisions inside the U.S. Those videos have been retweeted by President Trump and cited by Republican Senator Ron Johnson. And the Department of Justice charged a Russian who manages a Russian effort to influence elections. And his indictment is a sign of an ongoing Russian disinformation campaign uh, that has the same goal as it did in 2016, create distrust in the U.S. political process and to help President Trump. And the independent analyst I spoke to today, Judy, says all of this is more proof that Russia continues to be interested in tipping the scale, while China and Iran are more interested in longer-term intelligence-gathering operations. And these analysts fear that the director of national intelligence is downplaying the active threat posed by Russia to the election by instead highlighting the longer-term threat posed by China. So much to keep track of, but let's uh, let's talk about that. Amna, separately from this, there was this whistleblower uh, complaint uh, saying that the administration is trying to downplay uh, Russian influence. Tell us about that. That's right, Judy. The whistleblower is a man named Brian Murphy. He was the former head of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. Before that, he was a longtime FBI agent. And he's basically alleging in his complaint that he was asked to censor or to skew intelligence so that it better lined up with President Trump's messages and with his priorities. And he alleges a few things. In one uh, complaint, he says that the acting secretary of Homeland Security, that is Chad Wolf, told him to hold back on reports about Russian disinformation campaigns, to stop providing assessments on the Russian election threat and instead to focus on Iran and China. Murphy says he refused to comply in both cases. And former DHS officials I talked to said in their experience there was constant pressure from the White House not to talk about the Russian election threat. Murphy also alleges that he was asked by the second in command, that is Ken Cuccinelli, to change intelligence reports, to downplay the threat of far right white supremacist violence, and then to include information on left wing groups like the anti fascist group Antifa. There's a, con a bit of a complex complicated picture there. One former official I talked to said he doesn't believe it's a priority for the current DHS leadership to address the growing white supremacist threat. Another said that he actually thinks the agency's done a lot of good work on that front in recent years. Judy? And I saw today the president formally nominated Chad Wolf to be the, uh, the uh, secretary of Homeland Security. Amna, you've been in touch with uh, the folks at, with people at uh, Homeland Security today. What are they saying about all this? Well, Judy, they flatly deny the claims. They say that they welcome the results of any investigation. They say there's no truth to Murphy's claims. Here's what they said on the record. They said the agency is working to address all threats to the homeland, regardless of ideology, and that the acting secretary, that is Chad Wolf, is focused on thwarting election interference from any foreign powers, any attacks from any extremist group. Judy, we should mention that Brian Murphy has been invited by House Democrats on the House Intelligence Committee, testify before them in a private session. That would be on September. 21st, so we'll follow up more then. Judy? Again, so much to keep track of, almost dizzying for the American public uh, trying to follow what's going on in Washington with regard to these elections. Thank you both. It's such important reporting. Amna Navaz, Nick Schifrin, thank you. Thank you.
The political fallout from the president's comments to journalist Bob Woodward about the coronavirus remains to be seen. But there are also questions about what more could or should have been done when President Trump realized that the coronavirus was much more serious than he was publicly acknowledging at the time. The president says he was trying to avoid creating a panic. William Brangham explores some of those questions now. The Washington Post yesterday revealed that for his new book, Bob Woodward interviewed President Trump numerous times. On February 7th, this is what President Trump said to Woodward about the novel coronavirus. You just breathe the air. That's how it's uh, passed. And so that's a very tricky one. That's a very delicate one. Uh, it's also more deadly than your, you know, your even your strenuous flus. This is more deadly. This is five per... You know, this is 5 percent versus 1 percent and less than 1 percent. You know, so this is deadly stuff. But at that time, in public, the president was describing the gravity of the situation differently. Three days later, the president said this. Looks like by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. I hope that's true. Two weeks very after the Woodward call, there was this reassurance. We have it very much under control. The next month, the president was implying in a tweet that the flu was much worse than the virus. In June, on the phone with Fox News, as the U.S. saw roughly 20,000 new cases every day, he said this. It's fading away. It's going to fade away. Joining me now to discuss the president's response, as well as our broader national response, is one of the journalists who has covered this crisis as well as anyone that I have read, Ed Yong at The Atlantic magazine. Ed, very good to have you on the news hour. Uh, you've heard the Woodward tape, where the president certainly seems to understand the severity of the coming pandemic. And then yet we saw many examples of him both talking very differently about it in public and some would argue acting very differently uh, in his role as chief executive. How do we measure the consequences of the president's actions? Well, we've seen what happens when um, the person in charge of the country's response um, is not up to the task. Um, you know, we've seen what happens when you put someone who lies consistently, um, who doesn't trust to expertise, who chooses to feed his own ego rather than to look after the welfare of his citizens. And, you know, it's not good. Um, Trump is not by far the only reason why America has failed so badly to control COVID-19, but he is central to the country's failure. Um, his repeated attempts to downplay the pandemic, which we've heard now um, in stark detail, have lured much of the country into a false sense of security. And I've argued in my latest piece uh, uh, about America's pandemic spiral that a, a, a disaster of this magnitude was always going to be difficult for us to get our heads around, right? It was going to be uh, very Regardless seductive. Regardless of in charge. Uh, absolutely, right. Regardless of which administration was in power, it would be all too seductive to want to return to normal, to fail to grasp the, the size and scope of the problem. But when the person in charge is actively telling citizens everything is fine, it's going to go away, when he's boosting this tendency to succumb to magical thinking or silver bullets, then things start getting really problematic. And he's contributed to this fraying of, of, the, of the national um, understanding of this crisis. In that most recent piece in The Atlantic that you mentioned, you also point the finger at our national citizens' response more broadly. You write, the country has consistently thought about the pandemic in these same unproductive ways. Give me some examples of that. What do you mean by that? So, for example, we've bounced from one solution to another without really understanding that to control a pandemic, you need a lot of different solutions. So our attention flips from social distancing to masks, to um, treatments, to um, up, you know, coming up soon, a vaccine. Um, we need all of these things. We need to do testing. We need to do contact tracing. We need the masks. We need to put all these measures together but we seem to only focus on one thing at a time. So that's one issue. Um, we tend to focus on blaming individuals rather than fixing broken systems. So it's very easy to point a finger at someone who is having a party or someone not wearing a mask correctly. 
than it is to look at all the broken institutions, the carceral state, the healthcare system, nursing homes, and all, all the rest that have jeopardized America's health. The, the country has this sort of tendency to go from moralism instead of um, putting in the structures that will allow people to make better choices. But devil's advocate, how we are an enormous country. We have wildly different education levels. There's a growing distrust of institutions. And I don't just mean driven by conspiracy theories. I mean, this is a tough, big nation to govern. The things you're talking about, I'm just curious what you would see as a possible remedy for that, which I would agree, that larger societal problem. How do we remedy that? So um, I think that's why clear evidence-based communication from leaders is so important. You know, these instincts that I've talked about in my recent piece, um, these intuitions that lead us astray are pretty universal. You know, I've made them, you've probably made them, our viewers are probably making them now. They, I'm not judging people for them, but um, we can try and resist them. It helps if leaders um, show a way out, if they provide clear communication. And this is absolutely the opposite of what has actually happened, as we've heard from Woodward's tapes. Um, Trump and many of his associates have instead um, exacerbated these bad intuitions by feeding people um, lies, misinformation, a false sense of security, this longing desire to return to normal. You know, rather than counteracting those instincts and showing the country a way out, they deepened and worsened every faulty intuition that we would naturally succumb to. Uh, amidst all of this, is there anything that you look at coming forward in the winter or, or perhaps a vaccine or this coming flu season that gives you hope? So I think actually one of the best signs is that um, in the uh, Northeast, um, a lot of places that were hit originally very hard by the pandemic have actually managed to hold the line and kept cases pretty low throughout much of the spring and summer. And that to me is encouraging for the fall and winter. Um, in general, Americans have actually done a lot you know, they've taken to things like masks, with, which were unfamiliar, social distancing, and they've done that in the face of bad communication, lies, poor leadership from the federal government. Now, maybe they can hold that for the long term. I worry that people will get inured to tragedy, and that is a big risk going forward, that the, ex the unacceptable will come to be acceptable. All right, Ed Young of The Atlantic Magazine. You can read all of his work at theatlantic.com. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. For many Americans battling addiction, the pandemic has made life increasingly difficult. Across the country, overdoses have soared, with more than 40 states reporting increases in opioid-related mortality this year. But COVID is also changing how addiction treatment can be provided. And some experts are saying that it could be a silver lining in a devastating public health crisis. Stephanie Sai has our report. To be honest, I thought I was going to be sick the rest of my life. The pandemic has Dr. Stephen Lloyd touting the virtues of going virtual. Are, are your cravings under control? I mean, you're doing okay? Do you, you run into times where it's overwhelming? Consulting patients through video conference has opened up a new world for the addiction specialist. Oh, I know you are. I love seeing you. You know that. He used to have to evaluate patients in person before he could prescribe two of the most common medications used to manage opioid addiction buprenorphine and Suboxone. But in late March, the Drug Enforcement Administration said it would temporarily relax those rules. Hey, do I send your medicine directly to your house? Yes. Okay, all right. Practitioners like Dr. Lloyd now have the flexibility to prescribe medications via telehealth or over the phone, even to new patients. Uh, I was extremely grateful that that was available. Last month, Lloyd prescribed 40-year-old John Wilkerson Suboxone over the phone while he was still lying in an emergency room, suffering from severe withdrawal. He's been in recovery from an opioid addiction that began after a 2012 surgery. Without Suboxone, Wilkerson says he would take any opioid he could get his hands on. The medication helps block his cravings. I've been a uh, much, much better uh, husband and father. Um, 
I feel like my old self again. It's been the biggest game changer that I've had in my time in addiction medicine. Lloyd is the former head of Tennessee's Department of Substance Abuse Services and now serves as the chief medical officer of 20 treatment facilities in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Florida. He spoke to me via Skype from outside Nashville recently. Do you think that the opioid crisis, which was already an epidemic before the pandemic, is going to actually get worse because more people will turn to drugs? Stephanie, it's already gotten worse. And using telehealth, I get to see my patients in their home environment. And I've watched them from March go from nice apartments and houses they were living in to now hotel rooms to now the back seats of cars. And I see it every single day. Our, our overdose rate here where I am uh, is up about 20% with fatal and non-fatal overdoses. Lloyd says telehealth has expanded access to safe treatment at a critical time when experts predict opioid-related deaths could double this year because of the pandemic. If you think about the barriers that people have to getting treatment on an outpatient basis for something like opioid use disorder, uh, number one, transportation. Um, number two, fear of coming into an environment where you could be exposed to the, to the COVID virus. Uh, number three, be, the ability to get your medication, right? And so what telehealth has done is it has allowed us to meet people where they are. While the National Institutes of Health says there's abundant evidence that medications reduce opioid use, an estimated 80% of Americans who could benefit from the drugs don't receive them. Case in point, 40% of U.S. counties don't have a licensed provider for buprenorphine, the efficacy of which Dr. Lloyd himself is a living testament. Lloyd describes his own downward spiral into addiction. There's a saying in recovery circles that one is too many and a thousand's not enough, and that pretty much sums it up. Early in his career, he was driving home, feeling stressed, and found leftover hydrocodone pills prescribed to him by his dentist. He broke one in half and swallowed it. By the time I got home, suddenly my life was better. Suddenly this pain that I was dragging around with me and the anxiety and all the things that I was worried about just kind of melted away. Within a few weeks, he was hooked, and the next four years, he says, became a constant pill chase. You know, every day became about, do I have enough to get through this day? Uh, am I going to run out? Where am I going to get it next? But I couldn't quit because every time I didn't have the pill, I got sick. And it's all I thought about. Lloyd even pocketed extra pills from his own patients. My use just accelerated so much. And then, uh, you know, it, it becomes hard to find 100 Vicodin a day, right, even for me. By 2004, Lloyd says he was no longer able to conceal his addiction from his family. And his dad confronted him. He said, Steve, uh, he said, you have a drug problem. I said, yeah, Daddy, I do. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my medical license. I'm going to lose everything I worked my whole life for. And he said, he said, Steve, none of that stuff's going to do you any good if you're dead. At that point, Lloyd said he finally had the will to beat his addiction, but it wasn't enough. He also needed nine injections of buprenorphine at the beginning of detox. Medication holds cravings at bay and it gives people a fighting chance because people relapse because of cravings. It sounds like telehealth has really lowered the barriers for a lot of folks to get treatment, specifically medication assistance for opioid addiction. Why were those barriers so high, so high to begin with? A lot of folks look at medication as a crutch. Oh, you're switching one drug for another. And it, it, it perplexes me because we don't have problems treating other things that are largely behavioral with medication. And the example I always use is type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is largely behavioral. Don't eat right, don't exercise enough. Yet we treat it with medication all the time. But unlike other chronic diseases, addiction carries strong stigma and shame. That was embarrassing to me. I felt, I don't know, I just felt disgusting. 34-year-old Nicole Hernandez is one of Dr. Lloyd's patients. She's in recovery from a prescription opioid addiction that began in 2008 after a near-fatal car accident. She initially used powerful opioids to manage pain from her multiple injuries. At the worst point of this, how many pills did you need to take to dull the pain and to feel like you were addressing that issue? Uh, well, it depends on which pill, but like, let's say of the strongest ones, um, I don't know, like 20. Like many others who suffer addiction, Hernandez recalls becoming sure. someone she couldn't recognize. She forged prescriptions and ended up in jail, only then realizing the hold the drugs had on her. 
towards the end of your pregnancy? Like you didn't get cravings more in the third trimester? No. Okay. No. Hernandez is now prescribed Suboxone, okay. which helps lessen her continuous pain, she says, without the feeling of addiction and withdrawal. The virtual appointments have kept her from having to visit the clinic. No small comfort for the new mother of twins. It's just been awesome because I, I never had to leave my baby side. Lloyd says since telehealth became an option, patients' rate of showing up for follow-up appointments, a key to long-term recovery, has doubled. But on its own, telehealth is not a silver bullet. Oh, there's drawbacks to it. And, and I think for the person that tends to isolate, because the opposite of addiction is not recovery. The opposite of addiction is community and relationship. And one of the things that this takes away from us is that relationship. It's why Lloyd has also fought to keep the treatment facilities he helps oversee in three states open during the pandemic. As chief medical officer, Dr. Lloyd has instituted a host of safety protocols, including testing his own staff, isolating any positive cases in residential facilities, and frequent temperature checks. We're more crucial now than we've ever been. The folks suffering with addiction are more marginalized right now than they've ever been. And we have to be there with meaningful treatment that can help them to the best of our ability as, as our worlds get turned upside down. Even with the pandemic turning the world upside down, Dr. Lloyd has been able to expand his reach because of the relaxed telehealth rules, which he now says should be made permanent. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Stephanie Sy. Jane Fonda is a Hollywood icon with her Academy Award winning acting career spanning decades. She's also famous for her political activism. She describes her passion and protests advocating for climate change in her new book, What Can I Do? From My Path from Climate Despair to Action. Jane Fonda, thank you so much for talking with us. It's good to see you again. When we sat down together, uh, at the end of last year, you were sitting in at the Capitol. You'd been arrested four times. You said you had to put everything on the line, and you're still at it. it we're still facing a dire situation. The scientists tell us we have until 2030 to cut our fossil fuel emissions in half. And it's going to take an unprecedented effort by uh, unprecedented numbers of people uh, prepared to commit civil disobedience and that's why I did five real Fridays. That's why I'm still doing them, and it's why I wrote this book. This answers a lot of questions and tells people what they can do. I'm really proud of this book. What's the main thing you want to get across? You, you, it's your story of these protests and your engagement. What do you want people to take away? I want them to understand, A, that it's a dire situation that we're facing, and we have little time left to really do what's needed, what the science tells us we have to do. The reason we have so little time is because the fossil fuel industry lied to us 40 plus years ago. They knew what they were doing. Their scientists told them that they were causing global warming and that it was going to be catastrophic for the world. And they did it anyway and lied to us and tried to make us doubt the science. And as a result, the window um, has shrunk in which we, we can do something. So the book is shows us what we can do from both individual actions, but most importantly, group actions, getting together with a movement with large numbers of people and acting in concert to force the government to do what's needed. First of all, we have to vote. All the way through this book, it talks about the importance of voting, but then not to have it end with the vote. Then we have to roll up our sleeves and force the government to do what's needed. It's very, very practical. Of course, since you started all this, uh, some pretty big things have happened. First and foremost, the pandemic. How has that affected your ability to get your message across? We were worried, of course, with the uh, terrible things that has happened to people in the United States and, and in the world because of the COVID pandemic. We took our Fire Drill Fridays virtual. I mean, I may be 82, but boy, no, do I know how to do a Zoom meeting. Every Friday, we do Zoom. Judy, last Friday, we had 750,000 people following us across all platforms. I mean, that, that's kind of amazing. And tens of thousands of people are signing up to volunteer, writing letters, making calls to elected officials, getting people to vote 
um, especially going into the Latino, going into virtually going into the Latino community, making sure people vote and that they understand the importance of the of the climate. So what it shows us is that in spite of everything, people are still really concerned about the climate and are using this time when they're sheltering in place to do something about it and to sign up to volunteer. And it's been the pandemic and, of course, also, Jane Fonda, there's been the Black Lives Matter movement, which has come back to life over the summer, uh, people marching, uh, taking to the streets, uh, pushing for racial justice. Um, it, do you find there's, it's just harder to get people's attention, that there's a less of a bandwidth for environmental uh, change when there's so much else going on that people are concerned about? Actually, no. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the Yale Project on Climate and Communications. It's a, it's, it does amazing research. And one of the things that it has shown us is that apparently black people care more about the climate than white people do. And of all people, Latinx are the most concerned about the climate crisis. The climate crisis, it very much shows how much racism there is. The fossil fuel industry has for decades put their drilling and they're fracking and they're incinerating and they're refineries in communities of color and low income and indigenous communities under the assumption that these people lack power and won't be able to do anything about it. So people of color have really been impacted by the fossil fuel industry. You've talked about the importance of voting. I look back at what at our interview uh, last November and you said no matter who we elect, no matter how progressive they are. It won't work unless we're going to hold their feet to the fire. Does it make that much difference who's elected um, uh, in November? President Trump, after all, is saying this week he's the best environmental president since Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, well, wouldn't we all rather push a centrist than have to fight a fascist? Trump has been terrible for the environment, rolling back all the environmental regulations, including clean air and clean water at a time like this, the last thing to do, he's, he's drill, drill, drill. You know, he's in the pocket of the, of the fossil fuel companies. He's the opposite of an environmentalist. Joe Biden can be persuaded and pressured. He's already moved very far in the last year. So we have to get him elected and then hold his feet to the fire, as I said a year ago. And you acknowledge that Joe Biden has not embraced the Green New Deal, uh, which is something you advocate. So you're saying you think he can be he can be persuaded. I do. I think so. If there's enough of us out there doing the persuading, I you know again the the Yale Project on Climate and Communication says we only need three and a half percent of people to win new policies. That's eleven and a half million people in the United States. We can rouse 11 and a half million people to pressure the Biden administration to do what's right. I think we can win. There are already, according to that project at Yale, 13 million people who say they're ready to engage in civil disobedience, but nobody's asked them. I mean, there's a great unasked out there, and it's our job to ask them and then organize and mobilize them to do what's necessary. One last thing, uh, and this has to do with the other part of your life, and that is acting. You're about to shoot the final season of uh, Grace and Frankie. Um, there was a uh, we, we heard this week from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences that they have a new standard they're going to impose in coming years, requiring more diversity and inclusion, both on camera and off. This is for shooting movies. Um, do you think this is going to make a difference? And do you think Hollywood's doing enough in that regard? Well, this is a big deal if, if it happens. I have not read the details of it yet. I mean, obviously, the, the devil's in the details. For example, if you're making a movie, uh, if you're making Mad Men, well, there just were not a lot of people of color in those offices back in those days. So you have to be honest to the period that you're, that you're filming. But I like the idea that you put you know, rules in place that require companies to hire more diverse, with more diversity in mind. I think that that's really, that's really good. But I don't know the details yet. This just happened and I haven't read yet. Jane Fonda, again, the book is What Can I Do? My Path from Climate Despair to Action. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again, Judy. Thanks. 
82 years old, and she just keeps on going. Thank you, Jane Fonda. And that is the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Thank you. Please stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by Architect, Beekeeper, Mentor, a Raymond James Financial Advisor, Taylor's advice to help you live your life. Life. Well planned. Consumer Cellular. Johnson and Johnson. BNSF Railway. The Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. The Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Driven by the promise of great ideas. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. And friends of the News Hour. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS News Hour West. From WETA Studios in Washington and from our bureau at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University.